Hey, open your Bibles up to Exodus chapter 20 this morning. I do want to say one more time, thank you so much, worship team. Didn't they do a great job this morning? Um, if you happen to be new here, if this is your first time, we don't always do only old hymns or old choruses for, for worship. This is a special thing that we've done, we've been looking forward to, called Hymn Sunday, uh, where we just wanted to do some stuff a little more old school. You know, those songs, that the, I love newer stuff and I love older stuff and, and some of the stuff that we did today, you know, Oh, the Blood and Amazing Grace, those are songs that, that stand the test of time. Don't they, right? There's, there's great stuff that's new. And anytime we're praising the Lord, that's a wonderful thing. But some songs come and go, right? I don't, I don't know if, if, if Jesus tarries. I don't know if in 50 years we'll be singing, um, Let Everything. That has, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if we'll be singing that song or not. It's a, it's a good one, and I love it. But I guarantee in 50 years the church would still be singing Amazing Grace, right? That's just one of those songs, just a classic that stands the test. And I, and I love all, I'm not putting down new stuff. You, you ought to know that about me. Um, but I want to talk to you this morning in that kind of vein about some timeless truths. Doesn't that sound good this morning? I want to talk about timeless truths. You know, most of the time as we think about music and trends and those things, we... People seem to gravitate toward music that holds a special significance to them. Usually it comes from a special or significant season in their life. It's, so it's rare, for example, to see an older person who, and when I say older, I just mean older than me, who has been maybe raised in the church. They spent all this time, you know, they, they, they were every Sunday folks. It's rare to see someone who was raised in the church who loves contemporary new music and hates or, or strongly dislikes, you know, old hymns and choruses are the kind of things that you would find in a hymnal, right? That might happen, but it's, but it's rare. Likewise, for someone like me, I'm, I'm in my early 40s, right? And we'll stay there. Uh, but I, <laughs> I gravitate toward music that I listen to, whether it's Christian or secular, I gravitate toward music most that I listen to in my late teens, early 20s. And I'm pretty eclectic with my choices. So I like all stuff, especially, you know, uh, stuff from the 60s and 70s, and, and we've talked about that. But I feel the same way about that. I actually feel the same way about that about a lot of things. You know, I think society, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I kind of personally feel like maybe we peaked in the late 90s or so, right around the time I was in high school. I kind of, I just personally feel that way. And so I'm just waiting on some of those same trends that were going on in the 90s to just come back around because they tend to do that, right? I'm waiting on that blonde hair dye to come back, those frosted tips. Because I can tell you right now, I liked my wife. I was, I, you know, I was, I was trying to you know, put the moves on her, flirt with her a little bit that freshman year of college, and she complete ignoring me, right? Just had no interest. <laughs> But I came back with those frosted tips one day. <laughs> and the next thing you know, about a week later, we were dating. <laughs> one thing leads to another. Two years later, we're me. I don't know. Right? So I'm waiting on that to just come back around. Problem is, I'm going to be gray by the time that that does. And so it won't matter anymore. Right? I don't know. Remember a time maybe, um, gosh, I remember. I'll get in the message in a second. I remember uh, when you could smoke in restaurants. Right? Not that I'm not, I'm not a smoker. But I remember you'd go in, you would say smoking or non-smoking. You want to uh, throw a hostess or a host for a loop, say, I'll take two for the non-smoking section, right? And they'll say, what are you talking about? You used to be able to smoke on an airplane. you imagine just a tube of smoke <laughs> just going through the air 700 miles an hour? I don't know. Exodus chapter 20. You know, even though trends change, fashion changes, the world changes, right? God stays the same. And his word stays the same. Uh, in the Old Testament, God listed 10 things to Israel where he essentially said, look, above everything else that you do, make sure that you do these 10 things. We're going to go through some of those. We're going to focus on the first two this morning. We know those today as the Ten Commandments. And God's word says this uh, in Exodus 20. How about I read from my actual paper Bible, the one I use at home? How about that? Preachers love that sound, that, that onion skin kind of sound there. We love that. I hope you do too. I'm going to read Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above 
or on the earth below or in the waters or in the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation to those who, of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day. By keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And all the parents said, amen. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And let us say amen. Amen. One of the things that we see throughout Scripture, is that God doesn't change. Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The book of Numbers says that God doesn't change his mind about things. James says that God is always good. He gives good and perfect gifts, and he doesn't change like shifting shadows. And the illustration there that we see all throughout God's Word is that times do change. People's opinions change, trends even change, but God doesn't change. And if that's true, then the things that were important to him remain important to him. The things that mattered to God when when this was written, and all of those individual letters and books and all those things are written across thousands of years and generations and generations, those things that were important to God then remain important to him now. The things that were written in Genesis were still important to God in Revelation, and they remain important to him. Now, that means these are timeless truths. The history of the nation of Israel is a picture of how God relates to people and how people relate to him. And if you know the word at all, you know that the the Israelites lived for generations in, in slavery and captivity in the nation of Egypt, and then God used Moses and sent him before Pharaoh and told Moses to tell uh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And there were, there were the plagues and wonders and all those things. And finally, God used Moses to lead them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And he made them a free people. And the celebration of, of that time, the celebration of the Passover, the, the, the pinnacle moment of that is still, of course, celebrated by, by Jews today and even Christians today. And within a short time after being set free, God brought the Israelites led by Moses up to to Mount Sinai where he gave them what we just read, the Ten Commandments. And like all of God's Word, this is really where we're kind of getting to today, those Ten Commandments, don't have any other gods before me, don't make any idols, don't murder, don't steal, all those things. If we see those things as just a list of do's and don'ts, then we have missed so much. And not just those Ten Commandments, but all of God's Word. As a matter of fact, I think that that recognizing the difference there, that, that is probably more than anything else what separates growing, maturing Believers, those who have put their faith in Jesus and continue to take steps forward and continue to live more and more in victory for him, that's what separates those people from the ones who never get past the, the, the baby steps. They never really get far path, past that just making the decision. They pray to prayer and, 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 and they never go any further than that. That's the difference between maturing believers and those who stay immature. Because every time God says yes to something or no to something, every time he says thou shalt or thou shalt not, there's something deeper 
behind it. Several years ago, I, I actually taught a series going through the, the Ten Commandments, and I called that series the, the Heart of God series. And it wasn't a ten-weeker. I didn't spend ten weeks going through, you know, do not murder, right? For the most part, you don't need a 45-minute message on do not steal. I don't know, some maybe. But we've combined some things or whatever. But the, but the most important point of that series and what we, we kept coming back to, the main point of every week that we just kept hammering home was point number one on your handout today. And it's, it's become a life principle for us here. And it's this. It says, behind every command of God lies the heart of God. Behind every command of God lies the heart of God. That is a timeless truth. That's something that we can hang on to. And it's a life principle for us today. And what that means is every commandment of God has the heart of God behind it. Every time he says, yes, thou shalt do something, there's a reason behind it. Similarly, every time he says, thou shalt not, there's a reason behind it. Hear me on this. God doesn't say no to things. He doesn't say, thou shalt not do such and such just to ruin your good time. Do you know that? Because so often that, that might be how we feel. And if anybody ought to recognize this, it's, it's parents. If you're a parent, then you, more than anyone else, ought to recognize that, that when a parent says yes to something, it's usually because they, they mean something good behind it. And if they say no to something, it's not just to ruin your day. It's because there's a, a real reason behind it. Kids and teenagers too, they have a habit of asking for things or wanting to do things or just going and doing things that are unwise and, and dangerous. Anybody ever recognize that? Parents, have you ever recognized that? Kids just want to, they make, kids are ignorant, right? I'm not saying kids are stupid. They don't even know what they don't know. And the more mature you become throughout life, the more mature you become, the more you recognize your own ignorance in, in certain places. I don't know what I don't know. Kids have a tendency to ask for things or go and do things that are dangerous or, or that are unwise. I remember when my son Micah uh, was probably two years old, he was just walking. I don't know what it was, but it was like every electrical outlet was a magnet for him. He would just see his little tiny baby digit, and he would just... Start heading toward that. And if you, I mean, we caught him every time, praise God, but you'd pick him up and turn him around and he would just run the other direction, right? Doing this, the same thing. Uh, toddlers, kids, what do they do? They, they find something shiny or bright or, or, or a good color and what do they try to do with it? They put it in their, in their mouth. It's super dangerous, right? Kids don't, and, and then when you, as the parent, tell them no or you take that thing from them, they they wail, oh, I've been so unjustly treated, right? Why are you doing this to me? And they just know that you've ruined their day, right? Can I do and, and, and before I kind of move on from this, I wanted to mention something else. I'm still getting in the habit of using these paper notes. I'm not doing this again. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Next week, I'm back to my thing. Parents, um, I want to caution you about something where when your kids, when, when your answer is yes, let your yes be your yes. Amen. Sometimes a, a, a teenager especially will ask or a kid will ask them, say, hey, mom or hey, dad, can I, can I do such, such and such? Can I go over to my friend's house? Or can I watch such and such? Or can I, do, can I go outside and play? Can I do such and such? And, 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 and sometimes parents can get in the habit of saying, I don't care. You know, oh, I don't care. Go ahead. And we don't mean anything by it. Oh, I don't care. Go ahead. I even caught myself doing that a couple days ago. I don't care. Parents, if there's anything at all that you need to communicate to your kid, it's that you do care. And you might say that without thinking, but I want to caution you. I don't think I don't care is a phrase we should use as parents in that sense. Let your yes be your yes, and let your no be your no. And here's your example, because God never says I don't care. God always cares. He cares about his children. He's always cared, and he doesn't change. The heart of God doesn't change. And so if we go back and we look at those 10 
commandments that he gave to Israel, and ultimately he gave them to, to everybody. He gave them because he cares very much. So every time he says thou shalt, every time he says thou shalt not, there's that bigger principle behind it and maybe a good Bible study for you personally throughout this week or over the next month or something like that is to just go through those Ten Commandments and look and say, why would God say such and such? I know it's wrong to do this or I know I should do such and such, but why is that important to God? If Pastor Robert says that behind every command of God lies the heart of God, what's the heart behind this commandment? And I'll give you a little jumping off point here today. One of the things that we have to remember is that God, not only does he care, but he desires the best for his children, and he knows our tendencies. He knows that we're the kind of people that tend to point our finger toward electrical outlets. He knows that we tend to want to do things that are destructive for us because we don't, maybe don't know any better or sometimes choose to ignore the consequences, right? But when we look at those Ten Commandments, what are the first two things that God said. First thing he said is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have... Go ahead, y'all can talk back. It's, it's him Sunday. You shall have no other gods before me. And then right after that, he says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on the earth or beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. And so out of all the commandments, out of everything he says, he starts with those. Before he says, do not murder, he starts with that. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Don't have any other gods before me and don't make any idols for yourselves. Don't worship anything else and don't make anything else for yourself to worship. Why would he begin with that? One of the reasons we talk about the tendencies and how God understands our tendencies. He knows our future and our past. In this case, he knew exactly where the Israelites were going. He knew that as he was leading them out of Egypt and into the promised land, what were they about to be surrounded by? All of this temptation, all of these pagan nations. He knew the, the types of things that they were going to face. God knew that as the Israelites moved into a place of physical freedom, which was great. He'd taken them out of that bondage, out of that slavery in Egypt. They were about to be surrounded by people who worshiped anything and anyone other than the one true God. The Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, you name the ites, they were there and they worshiped everything but the one true God. So he begins by saying, get your priorities right. Keep the first thing first and you're going to be blessed. So put God first. Don't allow anything else to come before him. And if that was important to him back then, I promise you it is important for him today. Don't put anything first. And here's the secret. You get that one right, if you're a follower of Jesus, you really and truly get that right where you put Christ first before anything else in your life. You will start to live out all of the other ones almost as a byproduct. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you as well. He says, in context, he's saying, you're worried about all these things. And boy, do we worry about financial things, especially today. The economy does this, mostly this. Yeah. Right? Stock market and Bitcoin and all, that, you know, all, all those things, and, and who's going to get elected and interest rates. And man, it's tough right now. And Jesus says, you worry about all that stuff. And they were worried about the same stuff back then. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? How are we going to get by? And Jesus said, worry about me first. Put the first thing first, and I'm going to help you through the rest of it. Don't worship anything, anyone other than the one true God. Put Christ first. And let him deal with the outcomes. You get your priorities right there and everything else is going to fall into place. Now, I want to be clear, that, that, that did not mean that the Israelites wouldn't face challenges. Clearly they did. God told them that they would. That doesn't mean when you put Jesus first that you won't face challenges. I promise you that you will. But the promise that goes along with that is that he is with you no matter what challenge that you face. So those are the first and second commandments. Don't have any other gods before me and don't make any idols and worship them. And today, we're not really in the habit of making idols out of wood or stone. We don't carve things out and then go bow down. We don't, we don't worship things like that 
today. But what do we do instead? We put other things as a priority other than Jesus Christ. And when we put anything in the place that only he deserves, that thing becomes an idol. Anything that we put in the place of our, of our heart and of our mind, whether or not we think that we are worshiping it, when it takes priority over a relationship with the Lord, that thing has become an idol. That's a timeless truth. And if you hear me say amen. amen. Later on in the New Testament, Jesus is ministering. Y'all get something out of today? Later on in the New Testament, famously, one of the Pharisees comes up to Jesus, and he's with a crowd, and he wants to test Jesus. And he says, you know, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus tells him, well, you know what the greatest commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. God doesn't change. When Jesus said that, he, he's quoting the Old Testament, but I hope you understand, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That sums up the first four commandments. Put God first. Don't worship anything else. Don't take his name in vain and remember the Sabbath day. That is honoring God, loving him and putting him first. So, he, so with that first commandment, he sums up the first four of, of, the, um, of the Ten Commandments. Remember, God doesn't change. His commandments don't change. The things that are important to him don't change. But what was the very first commandment that the Israelites broke? Thank you. Before Moses can even get back down the mountain, before he can get, he's up there, the glory cloud, and, and he's face to face with God. He comes back down and his face is literally shining. He's got to put a veil over it. And first thing, don't put anything before me. Don't make any idols. He comes back down, and, and you're probably familiar with that movie, and, and he comes back down when he says, God has given me these 15, and then he drops one of the tablets, these 10 commandments, right? <laughs> it's not true. It's just a movie. I thought it was cute. But he comes back down with the commands of God, and what does he see? Pandemonium, right? They've made this golden calf. They'd had Aaron take their gold jewelry, which, by the way, had been a gift from God, the plunder that they had taken from Egypt, right? Not only did they leave, uh, they, did they leave slavery, but God made them rich as they left. And then they took that gift that God had given them, and they gave it to Aaron, and they said, pervert this thing. They didn't know they were saying that, but they said, Form, you, use this. They gave it to Aaron, and, and, and he said, give me all your, your gold and jewelry and all those things. And he formed a, a calf out of it, and, and, and he said, look, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt. Before he could get back down the mountain, they were worshiping something else, breaking that first one. And then breaking the second one at the same time. And, of course, we see Israel struggle over and over again with that same thing throughout the Old Testament. They're faithful for a while, and then they're blessed, and then they just run the opposite direction, and, they're, and they, they deal with the consequences of that. They become entangled with the things around them that God had told them to avoid, and they bear consequences, and eventually they find themselves back in captivity and in exile again and, and taken from that, that promised land. And so the biblical principle there is that obedience to God brings freedom. In our flesh, we think, well, if I've got to be obedient to someone else, that means I can't really do what I want to do. God is so different from the way that we think, right? Obedience to God, submission to God, contrary to what our flesh might think, that's what brings freedom. Disobedience to him always leads to captivity. And sin doesn't ever really satisfy. Point number two is this. Sin makes us a slave. That's a timeless truth. It has always been the case that sin makes us a slave. It doesn't ever really satisfy. Sin is always subject to the law of diminishing returns. That means there's always a thirst for more and a need for more to try and get the same high or try to get the same feeling or result. To put it in modern day kind of layman's terms, to get that same kind of feeling, you need a stiffer drink over time or a harder substance to abuse. 
And it's like that in many, in many areas. When you get into materialism, you always need a bigger house or a nicer car or a bigger boat or, or, or something like that, bigger TV. And it's not a sin to have a big TV or a big house or a big boat. I hope you get all those things. But the more that we pursue those things, if we put them over where they should be and we put them in the place that only, only God deserves to have in our life, then we become a slave to them. And the less and less return you get, and so you're caught. And God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God wants his people to be free. But worshiping anything else makes us a slave to that thing. And if you hear me, say amen. What does it mean to worship something? Again, we said usually we think it means bowing down or praying to something. Really what it means is just putting something else in that place of honor that should be reserved for the one true God. Placing that greater amount, amount of, of worth on something. And by the way, before I forget, when I say Jesus summed up those first four commandments when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, what did he say after that? He said the second greatest commandment is what? To love your neighbor as yourself. All of the rest of the commandments are about the way that we treat other people. Do not murder, do not steal, right? Don't bear false witness, don't lie about someone, don't covet their stuff, all of that. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That encapsulates the Ten Commandments. That Jesus, he knew what he was talking about, didn't he? If there's anything in my life, when we talk about idols and putting things in that higher place, if there's anything in my life that I can't let go of, the truth is, if I want to get down to the nitty-gritty, that thing's got a hold on me. Freedom is important to God. And if there's anything that I, that I have that I just can't live without, the fact is, in some form or another, that's got a hold on me. But freedom's important to him, and he doesn't want his people to be a, a slave to anything, worshiping anything other than him makes us a slave. And the circumstances led the Israelites to be slaves in Egypt. God didn't want them to stay there, and that's why he rescued them. That's why he was willing to, to move heaven and, and earth to bring them out of that and do what those miraculous things were that, that he did. But that was only a shadow of what he was going to do later that we read about in the New Testament. Because once you get to the second half of the book, you see the ultimate freedom bringer. Romans in chapter 3 says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 says the wages of sin. That means the penalty or the payment for sin, the consequences of sin is death. And that's not just physical death. It's eternal separation from God. And one of the hardest things for people to understand today is that but whether I like it or not, there are consequences for my actions. We're good at making idols for ourselves. Money, entertainment, entertain me all the time. It's an idol when that's our utmost pursuit. And the fact is the world is addicted to play. It's addicted to entertainment. People can't get away from the scrolling. It's, it's a problem. Self-image. Really, when we serve these man-made kind of idols, you know what we're really serving? Serving the altar of me. Serving myself. My wants, my desires, not thy will be done, but my will be done, as I say so often. And I become a slave to those things. And that is what Jesus came to do something about. Point number three, last point on your handout is this. Jesus came to set people free. That is a timeless truth. John chapter 3, in verse 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, it says, Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And you move down a few verses to good old John 3.16, as I like to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And verse 17 is important. Often it gets left out. But it says, For God did not... Send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Yeah, Quentin, you can come on and, and play. Will you stand? You want to talk about a timeless truth? 
God loved you and I so much that he saw the sorry state of affairs that we had found ourselves in, recognized that we had no chance of digging our way out on our own, no chance of making it right, that we deserved every bit of punishment. But he loved us so much that he took it upon himself. For God so loved. you and me, that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a timeless truth. That's a truth that every person needs to hear. That's a truth that I've devoted my life to. And if you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you've said, I believe that to be true. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me to save me from the consequences of my sins so that I could spend forever with him. Can we bow our heads? Can we close our eyes together as we get ready to to finish our time together today? It's been a fun day today. Hymn Sunday. Singing some classics. And then just talking about some, some very simple, timeless things from God's word. And this morning... The way that I want to close is just to encourage you in a a couple of things. First off, if you hear this today and you say, you know what, I've allowed some other things to take priority. Things that, they might not be sin, and they might be good on their own, but I've allowed them to to take a a front seat in my life that really should only be reserved for, for Jesus. Then right now you've got the opportunity to do this This not so hard thing with God's help, which is just called repentance. That means asking him for forgiveness and for the strength to turn away. Repentance is an active thing. It means I make that decision to it's God, I I turn away from that. I choose right now to put you first place in my life. And help me, God, to not allow anything to have that seat, to have that throne that only you should really and truly have. And so, Holy Spirit, will you minister to our hearts right now? So many of us in this room are are believers already. We've been walking with you for a long time. But, God, it's so easy to slip into that. You know, there's the tyranny of the urgent. God, that that, that where things just fight for our attention, they fight for our, our, our pursuit. Some things are good. Some things are stressors. And, and we've allowed those things to, to take first place. But today, we choose to, to, to put you back in the driver's seat. We choose to put you back in first place. And in those times where we're tempted to to do it again and to try and push you off the throne in some way and seat ourselves there or put something else in that place, God, help us to recognize the touch and the voice of your Holy Spirit convicting us and causing us to trust only in you and to keep you first place. God, we thank you for this day. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, I'm Robert Denard, the pastor here at Revelation Church, San Antonio. Thanks so much for joining with us online. And I hope that we get the chance to meet you in person very soon. Our regular services are every Sunday morning at 10 and 1130 a.m. Thank you so much also for your generous financial support. Your contributions through tithes and offerings allow ministry here to continue to advance. You can give online by going to our website, revchurchsa.com slash give. Thanks so much for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.